Father, thank you for our, our last uh, hour here together, and uh, thank you again for the saints, and thank you for uh, what grace is doing in our lives, what it's already done, and what it promises to do. Just continue to give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, um, again, verse 19, what or wherefore then serves the law? What's the purpose? It was, notice what he says. He says, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Now, let's really focus in on the purpose of God giving the law. Uh, in essence, it was given, listen to this, it might sound a little surprising, but it is true, given only in order to increase man's sense of his need. That's the purpose of the law. To make him realize his utter sinfulness and helplessness. Because prior to the law, men might acknowledge that they are sinners, but some would not even do so. I mean, we come across people in our culture today, and you, you know, do you know you're a sinner? Well, I'm not really sure of that, they'll say. <laughs> not really sure. So, you know, I think sometimes what we use as a tool to bringing them to the realization of their sinful condition is the law. Because how else would we do it? Were well, we going to stand there? They say, no, I'm not. We'd say, yes, you are. They say, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. And then whoever gets the last word in wins. Or do we... Do we carefully take the law and say, well, what does the law say? And, and stack yourself and your, your personal righteousness and your goodness up against the law and see where you stand. But this was the purpose, God said. I wanted to introduce the law so that man would realize his sinfulness, his helplessness, and lead him to cast himself on the infinite grace of God. To have people literally cry out when the law is revealed to them, I can't do it. I can't make it. I mean, our message to those who are seeking justification on the basis of the law is this. This is our message to these people. Stop trying to be a Christian. Give it up all together. Stop. Would we, what, would we, what else would we say? Oh, just stay at it. You'll get it. It'll click. <laughs> It'll happen. How will I know? Oh, it'll just, a bright light will come on and you'll get, listen, stop trying to be a Christian. How many of us have at times tried to be Christians? Yeah, look at that. The rest of you are liars. <laughs> We've all tried, but we have not been successful. I, I remember vividly we were in New York City, Madison Square Garden, and, and at that time, uh, Rachel Canino, she was our secretary, and a couple of other people, they were with us, and they were in the press club, which is where we go after the chapel service. We had a little something to eat before the game, and we're in the press club, and, and she had a credential on, and I'll never forget one of the members of the media said, um, what's that say on your credential? Because... On her credential, on our credential, it says, you know, chapel program. And she said, oh, uh, we, we're here with the chapel program. We're here with the chaplain. And, and, and the man says, so what does that mean? She, he says, what, is, what kind of religion is that? She says, it's Christianity. It's, it's, it's Bible-believing Christianity. And he said, oh. And then he stopped for a moment. But then he looked at her and he said, listen, can I ask you a question? And she said, yes. And he said, do you really think it's possible to be a Christian in this world? And she was so, you know, happy to be able to delightfully answer him and say, yes. And he just looked at her like, well, well, how? And then she began to share with him salvation by grace through faith. Because he is thinking, it's not possible. I've tried it. It's too overwhelming. There's too much temptation, too many distractions. 
uh, too many alluring sins out there that would uh, cause a person to stumble and to get occupied with it. It's just not possible. And she said, I would agree with you. She says, it's really, because he said, isn't it hard? And she said, no. She says, it's impossible. <laughs> and he looked at her like, but you just said you are. She says, right. God did it. Christ saved me. I couldn't save myself. I could not be a Christian. What a message we have to people out there that are struggling, that are striving, that are trying. And some of them are outside of the church. And listen carefully, some of them are in the church. But they're still trying to be Christians. You've got to give that up all together. You cannot become a Christian by trying, any more than you can become the Prince of Wales by trying. <laughs> How do you become the Prince of Wales? Anybody? Oh, stop it. You have to be what? You have to be born into the family. Then you may be, you know, in line and entitled to occupy that throne. You could be the Prince of Wales, but if you're not the Prince of Wales, but you have you, you look at your life early on and you grow up in, in London and you say, someday I'm going to be the Prince of Wales. Uh. No, you're not. <laughs> Somebody's got to tell that poor guy, it's never going to happen. And then when you look at the Prince of Wales, you kind of say, and I hope it doesn't. <laughs> you don't want that. But the bottom line is, you cannot become a Christian by trying to be a Christian any more than you could by trying to become the Prince of Wales. It's just not possible unless you're what? Born again, born into God's family. Or if you're of the seed, which is of one, not plural, many, but one seed, that is Christ. And, 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 and to elaborate upon this, think about Paul's letter to the Romans. What did he say as he talked about the purpose of the law? Listen carefully. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. The law was given that what? Every mouth may be stopped and the whole world guilty before God. I mean, people don't get that. They believe that the, the law was given that you would straighten up. God says, no, the law was given so that you would shut up. <laughs> that every mouth would be stopped. What would they stop talking about? Themselves, their goodness, their righteousness their ability to obey, their ability to keep what God has asked them to do. It just leaves you, and God says, just zip it. You can't do anything. Let grace come in after the law brings you to that place where you realize how utterly sinful and lost you are. Verse 20 of Romans chapter 3, through the law, Paul says, is what? The knowledge of sin. Tell me that isn't the truth. I'll illustrate it for you. Last summer, we went to North Carolina for a vacation with my family. And, and one of the things that my grandsons uh, wanted to do was ride bikes. Let's ride bikes. So we did. And uh, we got those bikes. And then we got to a portion. It was like in this community. We rented a place in this community. And, and we're on the bikes. And we were going over to this little pond looking at some fish or some turtles or something. And then I said, OK, let's go. And he says, let's go. And then we had to cross through this. Uh, part of the uh, community, but there's, there is a sign there. Do not ride bikes on the grass. So he takes off, and he's going down the walkway, and, you know, his good grandfather just hit the grass. <laughs> I'm a, I, I, and, he, and immediately he was like, no, not the grass. Don't you see the sign? <laughs> And I looked at him and I said, I saw the sign all right. He said, why do you think I'm on the grass? Because I saw the sign. And he just kind of started, looked at me, he's like, what are you doing? And he just kept going, the sign. I said, that's why I did it. Because of the sign. Because you know what we did? We proceeded to drive down these roads and there are beautiful houses with immaculate, impeccable lawns. But do you know that not one time did I even have even the remotest desire to drive up on one of those beautiful lawns? You want to know why? Because there was no sign. <laughs> Guaranteed you, if one of those uh, houses said, don't ride on the lawn, I'd have been like, watch this, and I'm going right over there. 
no sign, no law. Where the law is, there is the knowledge of sin. The strength of sin is in the law. Tell me what not to do and I will do it. You say, that's just sheer disobedience and rebellion. Yeah, but the law brought it out. Say it again. We said it last time we were together. There is nothing wrong with the law. The law is good. The law is just. The law is holy. As the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 7, the problem is it can't make us that way. He goes on. Romans chapter 4, verse 15. Where there is no law, there's no transgression. Acts chapter 13, verse 39. Let me read it to you. This is a wonderful portion of Scripture. Acts 13, 39, this is what it says. It says, and by him, referring to Jesus, all that believe, that's faith, are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. He's saying it. All right? How about Romans chapter 8, verse 3? He writes and he says, for what the law could not do. Why? Because it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, not by us, who walk not after the spirit, or rather not after the flesh, but after the spirit. What is he saying here in verse 3? The law couldn't get it done not because there was anything wrong with the law, it was the weakness of our flesh. That's where the problem is. But God knew that, which is why he gave the law, which was to magnify the sin principle. Paul goes on to say this, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. In other words, what is he saying? He said, well, maybe somebody could have convinced me that I was a sinful person, but when the law came, there was no question about it anymore. When the law came, I was a transgressor. I violated God's laws. So there it is. That's Paul's explanation. The law's main work was what? To expose sin. Holy smokes. I mean, that is just the opposite of what the law keepers believe that the law was given to accomplish. They believe that it's for righteousness. God says, on the contrary, it wasn't to reveal righteousness. It can't do that. It was to expose sin. That's its function. That's its main function. It's the law which turns sin into transgression, showing sin up for what it really is, a breach of the holy laws of God. You see, now it's like God took it to another level. You had sin before the law, but now you've got the law, and that means you're not just a sinner, you are a transgressor. You have breached the holy laws of God, and therefore you are in line for the just punishment of God. In other words, this seals the deal. It had to happen this way. Its intention was to make plain the sinfulness of sin as a revolt against the will and the authority of God. That's the purpose of the law. You're a violator. You have breached my laws. You are a transgressor. It almost as if it just brings you to a prison of despair and a prison of hopelessness. That's its intention. And what does he say? I know, I know, it should make us rejoice. And I'll tell you something. Come on. I mean, you think of the Apostle Paul. We, we should give him an ovation right now, the Apostle Paul. How about him? Unbelievable. I mean, wow. I mean, there's a lot of people I know that when you get to, you know, eternity, you want to meet and you want to talk to. You've got loved ones. You've got family members. You've got moms, dads, brothers. I mean, there's so many people. We're going to see them all. Friends, people in the body of Christ that have passed on before. What a great reunion. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to be looking for Paul. 
I'm going to be looking. I'm going to say, you grace guy, you. You really got it and you shared it with us and you, and, you, and you stood up against the Judaizers and you challenged the circumcisers and you didn't stand for the legalizers and you said it was all grace and you said you wouldn't stop preaching it and you said, I'm never going to change my mind. It's going to be grace now, grace tomorrow, grace forever. It's the gospel called grace. Paul said, he even goes so far as to saying it's my gospel. And he shared it with us. Now it's our gospel and we get to share it with others. Thank God. And notice what, the law, what it says here. It was added. He goes on and says that the law was added. Listen to this. Till the seed should come. It was added until the seed should come. And the seed, which we know. Listen, by the way, the first promise of the gospel is not in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament. It's Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where the seed of the woman was promised to crush the head of the serpent. And in the process, he would bruise his heel. That's the work of the cross. That's the first promise of the gospel of grace. That's where the, the devil received his PhD, his permanent head damage. <laughs> At the cross. That's where it happened. And so the law was given and it was added until the seed should come who would pay with his life for the transgressions of the law. So the promise in verses 19b and 20, that came to Abraham first. And by the way, what he's saying here in these passages is that uh, Abraham received the promise and it was firsthand from God. God spoke it directly to Abraham. You want to talk about the law? That's like third hand. It first comes from God. It was given to angels as mediators, and then it was given from angels to Moses, and Moses, another mediator, and then he passed it on to man. That's third hand, not the promise. That's first hand. That comes from God. We have a message. We have a gospel that has come directly to us, first hand from God, not third hand from man, from angels, and that's a blessing, and that's a wonderful thing. Make no mistake about it, but when you're talking about the promise, you're talking first hand from God. That's amazing. Verses 21 and 22, Paul says this. Is the, is the law then against the promises of God? How does he answer that? God forbid. For if there had been a law which could have given life, verily righteousness could have been by the law. That's incredible. Is the law then against the promises? No, no. No, no, no. If there was a law that could have made you and I righteous, then righteousness could have been achieved on the basis of the law. But there wasn't. That was not as it, its intent. That was not the purpose of God in giving it. In fact, the harmony, and there is a harmony, by the way, that's, that you can discover and that's found between the law and the promise, and it's that we inherit the promise because we cannot keep the law. So the connection between the law and the promise, don't miss it. You can't get to the promise unless you first go through the law. You got to go through the law in order to get to the promise. And then your inability to keep the, pro to keep the law makes the promise absolutely indispensable. You see? So the connection is wonderful. It's masterful. And, and li listen to what Luther says, and I refer to his commentary on the book of Galatians. He says, the principal point of the law is to make men not better, but worse. <laughs> I love it. That's what he said. The principal point of the law is to not make men better, but worse. That they may be humbled, terrified, bruised, broken, and by this means may be driven to seek grace to come to that blessed seed, which is Christ himself. That's gospel. So what does the Apostle Paul do? Think about it. He brings together Abraham and Moses and Jesus Christ, and he does it in eight short verses in Galatians chapter 3, and he spans a time frame of almost 2,000 years. That's a good little history lesson. That's divine history taught by the Apostle Paul. And he surveys practically the whole Old Testament landscape and he presents it like a, a mountain range. That's really how you should look at it. Paul is right. He's presenting this wonderful mountain range. 
And on the one hand, uh, you have the highest peaks, which are Abraham and Moses. But keep looking, because if you do, you're going to see Mount Everest, and that's Jesus Christ. That's what you see. Sure, you see Moses, and sure, you see Elijah, but you see Jesus Christ. It's like the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus was transfigured before them. And there appeared unto him, while he was transfigured, uh, Elijah and Moses. And then the disciples were like, wow, this is unbelievable. And then Peter says, we got to build three boots. And that's when God said, shut up. <laughs> Not going to have three boots like Jesus is, is right there. And he's on the same par, the same level with Moses and Elijah. They, 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 they fell down as those that were dead. And when they opened their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus. You know, Moses was the one who pointed us to Christ. Elijah was the prophet who said, look to the Messiah. It's all about Jesus. I mean, they are like the stars at night, but Jesus is like the sun that brilliantly shines during the day. That's the difference in the glory between them. That's why the Lord would have none of what Peter suggested about the building of the three boots. So we see Christ and him crucified. And he shows how God's promise to Abraham was confirmed by Moses and then fulfilled by Christ. Reminding us that the promise came first, not the law. The promise came first, not the law. Why? Because God knew that before he could make things better, he had to make things worse. Things had to get worse before they could be made so much better. So what did the law do? It exposed sin. It provoked sin. It condemned sin. It, it, it kind of lifted the lid off, the, off of man's respectability. And it disclosed what he is really like underneath. Sinful, rebellious, guilty, under the judgment of God, and helpless to save himself even the slightest bit. You know, and, and we, know what, we know what that's like, don't we? I mean... Haven't we had, haven't there been moments when God has given us a, a revelation of our own utter sinfulness? And let's be honest about it. We did not like what we see. I mean, we saw it and we saw, sometimes, sometimes honestly, we can go through life and we can, you know, because it's relative, we start thinking in terms that are relative and we, you know, we just look over at this guy over here and the way he's living and we're thinking, phew, thank God I'm not like him. And, you know. If things get really bad and we're having real bad days, we say, well, thank God I'm not like Hitler. Uh, you know, we just go, <laughs> everything is relative, relative, relative. But the bottom line is when the Holy Spirit shows you what's really in there, we are appalled. Because even what looks like our best motives are mingled with carnality, are mingled with wickedness, are mingled with darkness. That's the facts. We don't like to acknowledge it or see it, but that's why the law had to come so that God could kind of lift that lid off of man's seeming respectability and say, this is what you really are. And that should just make us fall down and realize that we are nothing. That's, what the, <laughs> that's the purpose. Expose sin. Uh, condemn sin. Reveal what we are. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said this. He said, it is only when one submits to the law that one can truly speak about grace. I like that. I think he's right. How can you speak about grace unless you have recognized the violations of the law that each of us have committed? And then we, we look at the glory of grace and what that grace has done, and we, we're just overwhelmed. It, it, someone once put it this way, it, it's only against the, the blackness of the night that the stars actually begin to appear. Isn't that true? You can't see those stars. You look out there early in the day, you can't see stars. But when, that, the, when the darkness of the night is there, then the stars begin to appear. It's like the nature of the law. It's got to show us the sinfulness before we can see the light of that truth called the gospel. And it's only in that background that we can even see the stars. It's only against the dark background of sin and judgment that the gospel really begins to shine forth and we see its glory and we see its value and we recognize what it's done for us it's like you have to be arrested by the law <laughs> some of us remember what that was like <laughs> you know you got to be arrested by the law and imprisoned by the law which will make us long to be set free 
by Christ and His grace. It's almost like that's where we were all found. We were in a prison. And Jesus came, and He's the one who had the key. And He opened that door, and grace liberated us and set us free once and for all and forever. And we never have to go back to that bondage again. Thank God. I think the law really was given just to drive every one of us to the point and to the brink of despair. And that's when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and then our hearts were filled with hope. And then he becomes the anchor within our souls. But you have to be brought to that brink of despair. I think it's, I think it's healthy. I mean, I know, I know that that was the case with my life. I mean, not only did I believe on Jesus, I accepted him as my savior, but there were moments when the Spirit of God gave me a revelation of my utter sinfulness and a revelation of his love for me as he revealed to my heart the cross of Christ and what was accomplished on my behalf. That did not just happen once, that happened several times so that I could really understand it and it could humble me and it could break me and I could realize that the depths of that love, I can't even begin to fathom that he would do that for me. And when the Spirit of God does that, what a difference that makes in our lives. Then look at the nature of this last paragraph here, verses 23 through 29. Verse 23, but before faith came, we were what? We were kept under the law. Literally, that means we were imprisoned by the law. Under the law means shut up, under guard, imprisoned. That's, what we, that's where we were. That was before faith came. We were imprisoned by the law, shut up unto faith, which would afterwards be revealed. And then verse 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now some people say, well, the law was our teacher, but that's not what this word means. The law wasn't our teacher because uh, the, the, the schoolmaster in New Testament times, it was called a, a pedagogos, a, a tutor, a guide, a guardian of young boys. It, he was a disciplinarian. And his role was not that of a school teacher, but he was in charge of the child's moral welfare. And it was his duty to see that he was um, acquainted with the qualities essential belonging to true manhood. This was the role of this schoolmaster. And he, he, he made sure that this child got to school and his goal was to deliver him to school and make sure that the child got to the teacher. And that is really a beautiful illustration of the law. The law was a disciplinarian. The law would be there to slap you on the hand and say that's wrong, that's bad. But the ultimate goal of this schoolmaster was to bring us to our teacher, who is the grace of God, who is the person of Jesus Christ. And tell me, doesn't the grace of God teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly and righteously in this present evil world in Titus 2, 11, 12, and 13? Paul said that's the function of the law, to lead us to Christ. So thank God the, the oppression of the law was never intended to be permanent. It was temporal. It was only until what? The seed should come. And when the seed has come, there is no longer a need for the law. So really, the dispensation of the law is now behind us, or as the Apostle Paul says it in the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 14, you are no longer under the law. You are under grace forever. The law fulfilled its temporary obligation. And then he concludes this passage in verse 25 by saying, but after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now we're being taught by grace. Now we're in Christ. Now we belong to our real teacher. And he describes in these final verses in this third chapter of what it means to be in Christ. We are his children. Okay? The disciplinarian was usually someone that was a hired servant in the home. He did not care necessarily for that child. He was just fulfilling his job, fulfilling his duty, meeting his obligation. But when he handed him over to that teacher, that teacher is really likened to the Lord Jesus Christ who loves us and who will take care of us and who will meet our needs and who will, you know, if he has to, as a loving father does, he will chasten us. 
He will discipline us, but only because He loves us and He cares for us and He doesn't want us to be judged with an unbelieving world. That's why He does what He does. So God, as it's brought out in these final verses of the third chapter, is no longer our judge. And we are no longer imprisoned by the law, which that's one, once was it, it, its function, but now he's no longer our tutor because you know, the law is no longer restraining us and holding us back and chastising us. But now we've been brought to God who is our Father, to Christ who has accepted us and forgiven us. And then when you get to the fourth chapter in the book of Galatians, we realize that we have now become the adopted children of God. You know what that means when you're adopted? It means you're chosen, right? You know, families, that's different. When it comes to family, you can't pick them. <laughs> you got them. You know, you ever say, oh my God, why did I get born into this family? But imagine an adopted child. You know what they say? I was chosen. I was chosen. You and I, as adopted children of God, can constantly remind ourselves and refresh our hearts and encourage ourselves by being reminded that God chose us. And he knew what we would be like. And it didn't stop him from choosing us. We would think, well, once he saw what we were like, he's going to kick us out. He was like, I already knew. And I already signed the papers. And I already made the decision. And you're never going to be anything but my children. And you're always going to be part of my family because once you're in Christ, I got news for you. You can't get out. Paul uses that term everywhere in the epistles, in Christ. You don't, you'll never find him using these words, you're out of Christ. Never. Because he knew once you're in, you can't get out. And then verse 26, for you are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ or in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, please, don't, don't, don't think here that the Apostle Paul is just, now he's focusing on baptism. He has, this is the first time he's mentioned baptism. And the baptism here is probably not that outward, symbolic message to the watching world that we belong to Christ. It's not water baptism. He's talking about being baptized by the Spirit into one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Don't, don't think that the Apostle Paul is just becoming like one of the Judaizers himself. I say, they were saying circumcision. Paul says, like, no, baptism. He's not saying that. That's not what he's saying. He says, you are baptized into Christ. Uh, and those of you that are in Christ, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. And then he goes, he says this wonderful thing. He says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. And there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. All the walls come down when we are all one in Christ. Because, you know, did you know that the uh, typical Jew would begin his day and he would get up in the morning and you know what the first thing this Jew would say? He would look at himself in, in, in a mirror and he would say, first of all, I thank you that I am a Jew, not a Gentile. I thank you that I am free, I am not a slave. And he would say, and I thank you, I am a man and not a woman. That's what a Jew would say every day. And what does Paul say? When you're in Christ, all those distinctions disappear. For there is no bond or free or Jew or Gentile or male or female. Now, don't misunderstand me. Men, don't start looking at women saying, you're just a guy like me. They're not. Okay? There are obvious differences, and that's not what the Apostle Paul was saying. No longer any genders. You know, that's not what he was saying. What he's saying is there are no more distinctions that keep us apart from each other that would keep us or hinder having fellowship with each other. The bond and the free all come to one table. The Jew and the Gentile, one table. The man and the woman, although so much separate from each other in the early church, no, no longer. They all come together. Now fellowship reigns in the body of Christ because we are all baptized by one spirit into the one body of Jesus Christ. And Christ is, in, and, and look at this in verse 29, if you, be, if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That, that is amazing. I, I want to read you a, a story written by um, um, Harry Ironside. And, and he tells this story. I think it really sums up the difference between um, 
the purpose of law and, and grace. And, and he writes and he says this. He says, some years ago, I took with me to Oakland, California, a Navajo Indian. One Sunday evening, he went to our young people's meeting. They were talking about the epistle of the Galatians, about law and grace. But they were not very clear about it. And finally, one turned to the Indian and said, I wonder whether our Indian friend has anything to say about this. He rose to his feet and he said, well, my friends, I have been listening very carefully because I am here to learn all I can in order to take it back to my people. I do not understand what you are talking about, and I do not think that you do yourselves. <laughs> but concerning this law and grace, let me see if I can make myself clear. I think it is like this. When Mr. Ironside brought me from my home, we took the longest railroad journey I ever took. We got out at Barstow, and there I saw the most beautiful railroad station with a hotel above it I have ever seen. I walked all around and saw at one end a sign that said, do not spit here. I looked at that sign and then I looked down at the ground and I saw how many had spitted there. <laughs> and before I, think, uh, before I think of what I am doing, I have spitted myself. <laughs> Isn't that strange when the signs say, do not spit here? I come to Oakland and I go to the home of a lady who invited me to dinner today and I'm in the nicest home I have ever been in in my life. Such beautiful furniture and carpets, so much so that I hate to step on them. I sank into a comfortable chair. The lady said, now John, you sit there while I go out and see whether the maid has dinner ready for us. I look around at the beautiful pictures at the grand piano. I walk all around these rooms. I'm looking for a sign. The sign I'm looking for is do not spit here. <laughs> but I look around those two beautiful drawing rooms and I cannot find a sign like this. I think what a pity when this is such a beautiful home, to have people spitting all over it. Too bad they didn't put up a sign. So I looked all over the carpet, but I cannot find that anybody has spitted there. What a strange thing. Where the sign says, do not spit, a lot of people have spitted. But here, where there is no sign, nobody has spitted. He said, now I understand that sign is the law. But inside the home is grace. They love their beautiful home. And they want to keep it clean. He said, I think that explains this law and this grace business. And he sat down. And everyone said, that's the best explanation I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> no sign in that house. Just like on those beautiful lawns that I rode my bike down that road. I didn't, I didn't even have a temptation. I didn't think to myself, if I thought I should just drive on one of their lawns, I said, why would you do such a rebellious yeah. thing? But back there where the sign says, don't go on the lawn, I was like, I'm on the lawn. I'm tearing up the lawn. I'm actually saying to my grandson, come on, ride on the lawn with me. But if he ever swerved over and ran on, got on one of those, I would say, no, no, stay off those lawns. He goes, those beautiful lawns, that's like grace. Grace doesn't say, stop it, don't do that. Grace just says, you are loved, you are accepted, you are forgiven, you are cleansed, you are justified, and it all happened because you exercised faith. And we just marvel at that. And the grace of God captures our souls and we say, I've never known anything like this. I've never heard anything like this. I think that's why so many of us came into this ministry in some instances a long time ago and some uh, maybe just a recent time. But years ago when I heard this man, Pastor Stevens, preach this message, I said, what is this? I've never heard anything like this before. Where did he get this? Is this original with him? It wasn't. He got it from Paul. Paul's passed it down to generations, but Pastor Stevens, like so many other, God bless them, spirit-filled men of God, he had the courage to preach it even when it wasn't popular. He had the courage to preach it even when people would come and try to contaminate it. He had the courage to preach it even when people would persecute him. He had the courage to preach it even when it wasn't popular and people said, that's not going to fill your church building, that's not going to send people into all the world. I beg to differ. We are in all the world today with a glorious gospel, with a gospel called grace. It's changed our lives. It's changing their lives. And while we have time left in our lives, let's do everything we can to help tell people about a promise called the grace of God. Amen? 
Amen. Let's pray together. <laughs> Father, uh, we thank you, Lord, for, uh, well, we, we're just so grateful that we can study the book of Galatians. And we're so grateful for what it contains, the power to liberate us, the power to set us free. We thank you tonight for the law. Imagine we could say such a thing. Thank you for the law. It imprisoned us. It condemned us. It brought us to the doorsteps of grace. And that door came open, and there you were, the fullest expression of grace and truth. And you welcomed us in, claimed us as your children, adopted us into your family, and you've been teaching us by that grace ever since. Father, thank you for this gospel. Thank you for what the grace of God does in our lives. And may we never waver in our understanding of it, never waver in, in our conviction about it, and, and give us the grace to proclaim it to others so that they can into the, enter into the glorious liberty of the children of God. We ask it all in Jesus' name with great thanksgiving in our hearts tonight. Amen. Okay, you're dismissed.